This is the We Are Her podcast for survivors of abuse or assault to share their stories. I'm your host, Emily Kemp, and I'll be having a conversation with a different survivor each week. I want to be sure to include a strong trigger warning with this podcast. The content we discuss includes topics related to violence. Listener discretion is advised. podcast. Um, thank you so much for, for being on this episode. And I know you want to kind of remain anonymous and not use your name. So we'll skip introductions and then I'll just kind of have you um, say hi and, and kind of start sharing wherever you want to. Okay. Thank you guys so much for having me. This is kind of a, um, I had a lot of nerves on a lot of different levels. Um, my first time sharing was actually at a, a um, domestic violence retreat um, where there's like 12 women who had been through similar of sort situations. Yeah. And so this is really my second sharing, hmm. which is quite a bit more large <laughs> than 12 women. But, um, but it's also, I found it very healing hmm. just sharing with the, the 12 women that I did. And and thank you. Like, I feel really, I didn't know that. And I feel really honored that you're willing to share with us, you know, even at kind of the beginning stages of your journey. So thank you so much. That's, that's huge. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Good. So, um, you know, I usually just let whoever I'm talking to sort of start telling their story wherever it makes the most sense to them. Well, um, I think that what I've found is that a lot of um, people who are not familiar with domestic violence get um, an idea that women who come from that come from a certain space mm. um, of upbringing. Sure. And it's, I don't find that to be true. Um, I was raised, um, my parents have been married over 45 years. Um, my grandparents, my grandma was married at 16. They were married. I don't even know how long until my grandpa passed away. Um, I have a very strong, loving family dynamic. Um, I was homeschooled for like through high school, um, but kind of a sheltered atmosphere, really. Um, and I was like dying to like get to the big city. Yeah. Um, so I told my dad, hey, I'm moving to the big city and um, whether you help me or not, I'm going uh, I'll drive the U-Haul myself if I need to. <laughs> and he was like, okay, fine. So I moved to the big city, um, which is about three hours away. And um, I started going to um, school where I was in school 40 hours a week and I was working 40 hours wow. a week. Um, they told me it was impossible to do that, the administration. And of course I was like, oh, I can do it. It was really difficult. It was like the hardest thing. There was no dating. Like I didn't have time for that. Right. Um, and when I graduated, I was exhausted mentally, physically, emotionally. Like I didn't even want to do what I went to school for. Just <laughs> burnt was, out. I, I was burnt out, which made sense as to why they told me not to do that. Right. But um, I started just working. I got promoted in the, in the, um, the job that I was at. Um, I didn't want to mix work and pleasure. Um, and so I didn't date like in the workplace, right. but I worked all the time. So it was kind of like, well, how do then how do I maybe bring in kind of dating into my life? Um, I started some online dating, which you have to be very, very, very careful with. And that is where I had met him. Um, um, I don't want to say my abuser. I try really hard to not claim him as mine, mm. but it's, it's something you have to work for, work towards. Um, I, it's not, he's not anyone that I'd ever had been introduced to in my life. Um, his pictures were very something you would see in a magazine. 
So I didn't really think like he is no way he's real. Mm. He was that big buff guy that was like in the water on the beach and the water splashing behind him. And he was like exotic and mm. everything that women's like, ooh, you know, wow. Yeah, he was like presenting a specific persona online. Yeah. But I mean, like it's not anything that country girl that I was from had ever like, I'd never even seen anything like that where I was from. Right. Um, but of course it intrigued me. So I pursued the conversation. Um, I turned him down many, many times. And it was probably my inner self saying, no, you shouldn't do that. Mm. (laughs) And I didn't listen to her. Yeah. Um, so I went forward. And can I ask you what, what kind of those conflicting forces were like for you? Like what was telling you, you know, your gut was telling you one thing and then kind of why, what was going on outside of that, that sort of led you to pursue this relationship? One, I think it was curiosity, Mm. which I hate to say, um, I'm from the country. I dated country boys. Um, I liked a two-step. I like country music and he was the opposite of everything that I'd ever known. My mom was a very, um, a very strict mom, Mm -hmm. you know, I wasn't allowed to date until I was 17. I didn't get a car until I was 17. I was home. So, you know, there's a lot of like constrictions growing up. Mm-hmm. He disappeared and looked like it was everything that I was raised to stay away from. Right. Yeah, that's tempting. It was like this, like, well, it's kind of like maybe like that forbidden fruit mm-hmm. that you're like, mm, I just want to meet him. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like just meet him so I did and the first date was was great um and I'll give a little bit of tidbit information now that'll make sense a little bit later but our first date was at this really gigantic house of a doctor Hmm. it was his his party and the doctor was interesting um I couldn't put my finger on it but he was just odd Mm mm-hmm like okay you know I didn't I just that little bit in your head that's like he's kind of an odd everyone that was there just seemed different they were just maybe not what I was familiar to which is fine but we um we had a great first date um we went we had a second date um and the second date was a lot more pressuring Mm -hmm. My nose were not accepted. I didn't find out until after, until my healing point, the last few years that it was rape, but I didn't realize that's what it was then. And I think that's kind of a common misunderstanding. We have these ideas about consent and this idea that no means no, but um, we don't talk a lot about coercion and how that plays into sex and what that means about consent. And if it's a pressured or coerced Uh, yes, uh, that's not a real yes, right? Like if someone's like, please, 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 please. And you're like, no, 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 no. And finally you're like, okay, fine. That's not a true consent, right? Because someone badgered you into saying yes. And I think that we don't talk about the nuances of that, of that consent um, conversation very well. So I really appreciate you sharing that piece. Yeah. It took a lot of um, understanding maybe Mm -hmm. to get to that point. Um, it wasn't something I was like, oh, okay, that's what it is. Right. It was kind of like, is really, that's okay. I need to read more about and like really get to understanding and like a peace of mind about it. And it, and it truly what it's, what it was. Um, so he, he's, he's well known and, and where we are, where we live, um, and all over the U S really and internationally as well. Um, it wasn't uncommon for us to go in public and people like, Oh, aren't you, I saw you on the front cover of like this magazine or I, aren't you so-and-so and And you'd be like, yeah, that's me. You know, like, you know, you should let me train you because he is a bodybuilder. Okay. And so it was like, um, yeah, you know, let me, let me give you my number and I'll, you know, I'll see what I can do. There was a little of like kind of um, 
fame stuff going on there mm-hmm. that was like oh I've never been I mean I've never been a part of anything like that before that was a bit of a different dynamic right so anyways we we dated for um o- overall like three and a half years the very first red flag that came up I previously had a protection order and he knew about it mm-hmm. from from an ex of mine and I'd gotten out of my car one day at work and I was wearing a polka dotted dress. Well, he, the guy, him, he had saw me before I went to work that day. And, um, when I got to work, I got a text. that was like, Oh my God, you look amazing. in that polka dotted dress from a number I didn't know. Hmm. And I was like, Oh, what is this? And I was like, I'm sorry, who are you? And he was like, I can see you. You look amazing. What did I do to you? If I could just, you know, see what's up that dress. And it was very creepy, mm-hmm. right? So it was kind of like we run into work and I was fr- a little freaked out. Yeah. To say the least. We had um, the area that I worked in was a high, um, a high traffic area. So we had a patrol officer um, who was, um, he would come on like off duty sure. on the weekends. And so we had a good relationship with him and I was a manager at the time. And so I called him and I'm like, I don't know what this number is, but like, I feel I'm only here by myself. So I text him and said, I got this crazy like text message from this number. I don't know. And I'm like, so I called like the officer because I didn't know what to do. And he was like, I don't know how you could be so fucking stupid. What were you even thinking? You never called the cops for anything. That was me the whole time. I was just joking with you. And I was like, why would you do that? To me, it was like blowing my mind. Like why? Like is that funny to you? Right. And so of course the cop was there at that point. And so he got on the phone with him and was like, that is a level of harassment that you like, that's not okay. It's not a joke. That's a violation of your boundaries. And to get joy or pleasure out of seeing you so scared is, um, yeah, that's definitely a red flag. It's a huge red yeah. flag, right? Yeah. Like most people would be like, wow, okay, I'm done with you. Right. Well, yeah. Well, um, of course my, you know, the cop was like, like, seriously, you've, this is, this really needs to be something that you kind of learn from and move on. And I was like, I agree. I absolutely agree. So I told him, I, I don't want to date anymore. I, that was, that was wrong. That, that made me feel all kinds of things. I don't want to feel, mm-hmm. um, I don't know why you would do that, but like, we can't date. So we stopped dating the whole summer. Um, I didn't talk to him. He, I would, um, actually I blocked him on my phone just cause I didn't want to receive any messages from him. And I got an email late that summer and he had said that, um, he had been dating that summer and never met anyone that was quite like me, uh, that I am not typically what he would date or ever look at, hmm. but that I found, I, I intrigued him and that he wanted to pursue and get to know me better and that he was just so sorry. Essentially, long story short, that's what it said. But even in that, there's like a weird ebb and flow of like flattery and yet like criticism and kind of a backhanded right. compliment, but then more flattery. And what a confusing message. Yeah. You know, on one hand, you're like, no, nope. OK, thanks, but no thanks. On the other hand, I sat there and I would read it and I'm like, OK, well, you know, maybe it was just a bad joke. And then after months go by, you stop, you start right. to kind of forget how bad it was. Right. The edges kind of yeah. soften out a little bit. Right. It's easy to rationalize away if they said it was actually a joke, you know, maybe it really was a joke. You start second guessing yourself. Right. Right. Um, so, you know, we started talking again, <laughs> like it was now that I look back, that was, a, it was a horrible turning point, but uh, we started talking again and my, and his mom was passing away of mm. uh, cancer. Um, so he was very emotional up and down. And I thought, okay, if we, maybe if we take a trip to like, you know, a trip to like Mexico um, and we just get away, right. We can just get away and we can get to know each other and like kind of get away from the hustle and bustle only for like a couple of days, like three days and come back it might be really good for us. 
Well, we went and it was really bad. Mm. It was horrible experience. I'd given him my, I, my, my pad, um, to do some work on because he said that he didn't have any way to work with his clients back in the States. And he wanted to look at my Facebook. And then he wanted to look in my pictures. And of course, I didn't care. I was like, sure. I mean, I didn't have anything to hide. Um, but abusers are looking for something. Right. And he found what he was looking for, whether or not it was a cousin of mine that I was hugging in a picture. Right. Or if it was an uncle when I was like 13 years old, that an uncle that I was like one of my favorite uncles, it was, it was not okay. Um, so it went to ripping clothes, throwing me across the room by my hair. I, it was, don't go to sleep at night. I'll cut all your hair off. Mm. Um, I tried to get a flight out and there were no flights going out. Not anything sooner than what I already had. I mean, it sounds like he knew he had you trapped there. Right. And you didn't, right. which is part of we were in villas that weren't right. like super close to one another and other proximity of other people. Right. Um, I really condensed down how horrible that trip was, but Mm. it was really, it was bad. I had bruises on my neck. I had bruises on my ribs from kicking, um, from like bruises on my head from him punching over the head. It was, and it like, and I I remember how I got so shaky, Mm -hmm. like I was just shaking all the time. So I was shaking just 24 seven and I didn't leave my room because I was afraid of anyone seeing the bruises on me. Mm -hmm. And he kept saying, I just need you to take a lie detector test that you've, um, of how many people that you've slept with. Mm. And I'm like, well, I haven't slept with it. I haven't slept with very many people. And he was like, well, exactly how many have you slept with? I need to know exactly how many, and you need to take a lie detector test to prove it. Of course, in the beginning, I'm like, I'm not going to take a lie detector test. Are you kidding me? And then I thought, if I tell him that I'll take a lie detector test and he'll calm down. Mm-hmm. And I, he did. So you're like in survival so, mode at that point and just saying what like, you need oh, to say to get out of the situation. Yeah, absolutely. I'll take one when I get back. Mm-hmm. So that was in, um, I won't say year. So when we get back, I say, well, I'm not taking one. Newsflash <laughs> back in the States, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> not taking it. Bye. Right. So I left. Well, then I got flood of text messages. I'm so sorry. I should have never told you to take lie detector tests. That was really just crazy of me. I was just really jealous and I'm really sorry. And you didn't deserve that. And I'd really like, you know, I know that that trip was supposed to be for us and, um, I should have never acted that way. You didn't deserve that. I'll never act. I've never done that before. I'm just really sad about my mom. Mm. So finding something to an excuse to kind of pin it on and rationalize it. And I thought, no, there's no excuse, right? There's no excuse. There was always just, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Like you didn't deserve that. And I, I care about you and you're the most beautiful girl I've ever known. And you're just beautiful inside and out. And, you know, when you start just getting all of this and then I would block them and they come in through emails. Mm -hmm. And then I went and saw him and it was like a, a wave, right. Of like ups and downs and um it was it was like that for a long time until um it it was just so up and down well things were great and things were horrible and things were great and things are horrible and then I looked into mission trips like Mm -hmm. I need to get away because I can't get away from the sky right like there's something internally that I've, I need to deal with and I've got to get away. I I can't be here. And and like, he's, he's horrible. He's toxic. So I looked into mission trips. Okay. I'm going to go on a mission trip for like a whole year. (laughs) I'm just going to leave. I'm going to pack a bag. I'm going to go. So I applied and I'd written everything that I needed to do. And I was getting money for it. And I found out I was pregnant. Oh, wow. And I was like, that changes things. Oh, I thought I knew what my plan was and that's not what my plan was. Right. So, um, uh, of course I'm super sick cause I'm pregnant with a girl and I'm super, super sick and I'm super conflicted. 
And then I also, um, I got an email. I hadn't talked to him in like, since I got pregnant. So when I did get pregnant, it was a really, really bad night. So I know exactly what night it was mm-hmm. that I got pregnant. I'd ran from his apartment that night and I'd gone home and it was like, it was just a couple of months that I knew I was pregnant and his mom passed away. Mm. And I was thinking, I'll just raise this girl on my own. Like he doesn't even need to know I can like move away somewhere and I'll just raise her. And that'll be that. Well, that's like dreaming, <laughs> but it doesn't really work out that way as it does in your head. But um, I got this, a bunch of emails about how his mom had passed and how could I be so cruel to not, talk to him support him and reach out you had been there through the whole process of her dying and right but that's just another way like that's such a manipulative tactic you know to pull on that emotional place in you because you are kind and you are giving and and caring like he knew exactly which string to pull to get you to come back and rope you back in yeah um (laughs) so of course I'm the one that knows I'm pregnant and I'm like could I ever tell my daughter one day that I was pregnant with her and her grandmother passed away and I never cared? Mm. Of course, that is my own self. I don't know, beating up on myself, Mm -hmm. like abusing myself emotionally to think that that is something, you know, that I would have to do, you know? But it does complicate things. Kids complicate things. Now it's not just about you and this other person. There's this right. third party involved that is is 50% this other human being. And how do you then, it just makes one more layer and that much harder to extract yourself from a situation. And that much more confusing for you as the person in the situation trying to figure out what to do. And I don't think it sounds crazy at all to hear that line of logic where like, oh my God, you know, here I am with this, I'm pregnant with this child and her grandmother just died. I mean, like you said that and I was like, oh yeah, no, I understand why that, I 100% understand why that makes sense. Not only that, sense. everybody in his life, like his mom's aunt and uncle and his father and his brother, everyone just talked about how amazing she was. This right. beautiful, godly, uh, Southern blonde who went to church every Sunday and was big in her community and helping children. And she wanted to be a teacher and she was soft-spoken and kind and all these things of being just an amazing woman. And I'm like, like, and I don't honor her. To me, I was like, felt like I was dishonoring Mm -hmm. this amazing woman. So of course, what did I do? I fell back in and I emailed back and said, I'm just, I'm so sorry. Like, how can I be there for you during this hard time? So, of course, I went to her funeral and I wore a bigger dress, right? So my stomach went really show. Well, we went out to eat and my big thing when I was pregnant was fish. Couldn't smell fish, like made me super sick. Of course, he's a bodybuilder. He eats lots of fish mm-hmm. and eggs and all the protein. And all the things that make you want to throw up. All the things that make you want to like up check. So he's sitting there eating fish and I like had to go to the bathroom and vomit. And he's like, (laughs) he wasn't a very um, complimenting man, but he was like, wow, you look like your face looks fluffy and pale. (laughs) He was like, what's wrong with you? And I was like, nothing. He was like, if I didn't know any better, I'd think you're pregnant. And I was like, why would you say that? And he's like, because I've seen girls pregnant before when I've trained them. You look like you are. Of course, I fell apart, right? I'm like super remote. So for months and months, it was very up and down. We didn't live together. I lived with a family member um, who was a very supportive family member, um, but very up and down. Um, Towards the end of my pregnancy, um, there was a lot of beatings, uh, Mm. kicking to my stomach. Um, pulling by my hair, throwing me to the walls. There was a lot of appointments to the doctor where I was just like, I don't know if she's okay. And, and I, I want to add too, and this is kind of a tough statistic to hear, but um, 
for during pregnancy for survivors, uh, it's an incredibly dangerous time for them. And in the United States, um, women are more likely to die at the hands of an abusive partner than they are from any other uh, related birth complication. Um, and that's and that's it can be a real critical time for survivors. And a big part of that is because it threatens that abusive person's power and control because all of a sudden there's this other thing coming into the picture that's taking the attention away and women get strong when they're pregnant you know they go mama bear and they're and so it threatens kind of the dynamic like uh uh-oh like she might wise up she might get strong and say no 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 and so um it can be a very 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 lethal time for women and so I I know that was probably really hard for you to share and I really appreciate you saying that Um, at the end of my pregnancy, like seven or eight months, um, I don't, I didn't know anything about bodybuilder life, um, or even drugs in general. I'm very holistic. Mm -hmm. I like very organic foods, homeopathic medicines, essential oils, um, anything holistic that you could potentially talk about. I just feed off the conversation. Mm -hmm. Um, of course, I was with someone who was very into every drug known to man. So I started to find that he was a heavy drug addict mm-hmm. on on a lot of levels. So heavily on steroids, right? Because he was so large. Um, even being pregnant, I only ended up gaining 18 pounds total. There was so, I was so sick. And there was so much anxiety and stress going on. Um, But at the end of my pregnancy, he had decided to go and do three bodybuilding shows back to back. So what that means is that he had to be on a specific level of steroids for a longer period of time than what the typical person that is doing that kind of show would do. To maintain that muscle mass. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's a very, very high level of steroids for three times the amount of time than they should be on it. So he was 280 pounds. Um, not a tall guy, like 5'10, 280, not any fat on him at all. Um, gigantic. And I probably weighed at almost full-blown pregnant I was 140 so definitely like half of him and um he was horrible during that time I mean like a gorilla like you have never seen he was when he got mad every single vein in his face and his body and his legs everything in him popped it, his eyes, I would see his eyes turn red, his eyes would turn black. It was like, it was like nothing. It's like something really that I feel like I would see out of a movie. Mm-hmm. And it's not even anything that I saw as bad even before. Like he's, he's a heavy steroid user anyway. So he's been on him for 17, 18 years. But when he's at the heavy level, there's a mix of opioids and steroids at the same time. Mm. And it's such a heavy mixture that it's, you just better not get in its way. Just amplified everything. And yeah. I, and I think that's a really, um, a common misconception about abusive people and drug use that somehow like the drugs cause them to be abusive, which is not true there, but it can make things more escalated and more volatile and more unpredictable. I mean, if you have an abusive person and they're using substances on top of that, it's not a great combo. So um, yeah, it can make things really extreme. Yeah. um, I, I, I didn't talk to him the last couple of months, Uh, the last like maybe two months or so of my pregnancy. And my, I couldn't handle the, um, how bad it was. Mm -hmm. Like, I was definitely afraid that he would, he would kill my baby mm-hmm. and kill me as well. Um, the doctor that I was seeing was a doctor friend of his. 
um, they told, he told me if I, if I went to her, then, um, my visits would be free. Mm. And, um, she was one of the best in the state. And so it, it would be fine. Um, of course I didn't have a lot of money. And so, you know, it was definitely something that I had to weigh. I went to her and I did tell her because she was worried about my weight. Mm -hmm. And I said, I have to have a confidential conversation with you as being my doctor. And I am being abused. He, he beats me up all the time. It's, it's really bad right now. That's why he's not at my visits. And I don't want him to be alerted of my visits. And I don't know that I want him at the hospital when I have her. Mm. And so, and I said, I want you to make record of it. And so she said, okay, I will. And this is how we go about it. And I really want you to just try and relax. And I want you to, you know, make sure you're eating. And I'm really worried that you're not gaining enough weight. And I was like, okay, well, I'll just try and eat more, you know, do my best. Um, When it got to about a week or so before I was supposed to have her, um, he had come back around. He was off his, he was off all of his heavy stuff. um, And it was, I want to take you to get a manicure and a pedicure before you have the baby. And we had another episode where I was having heavy contractions in the car and he wouldn't let me out of the car. So he just drove around the this, this city until um, until I just would agree that he was right or I would just say, okay, I'm willing to, I'll, I'll talk to you, whatever you want me to talk to you about, whatever you want to know or whatever you want me to say, I will. Like, I have to get to a hospital. I have to get somewhere. Like, I was having heavy contractions on top of that you have that fear, right? That fight flight. And so I was really shaky, but I was having contractions at the same time. And so it was like, my whole body felt, I felt like my my whole body was going to like fall apart really. Um, That's very scary. The next day I ended up going in and having my daughter. Um, What originally I didn't want him there. I fell apart in the moment. And had him there. Um, I mean, he had just driven you, I mean, essentially held you hostage in a car and forced you to tell him whatever you wanted. So, and you're just so vulnerable at that point, like on the verge of giving birth that you had a job to do and to focus on yourself and, you know, just to kind of appease this other person to stay safe was what you had to do in the moment to survive, you know? Right. And when it's followed up by I just, I'm so sorry. I love you. Like, I'm just so fearful of being a father. Mm -hmm. I'm just fearful of being a dad and I'm fearful of being the kind of man I need to be for you. And I don't have my mom anymore. That was always that, that last sentence was, but my mom died. And I'm not insensitive to someone losing their mother. I haven't lost mine and I wouldn't wish it upon anybody. But after every instance of abuse it was but I lost my mom right but I'm sad about my mom and there's always that I'm sorry you might hear my cats in the background that's okay <laughs> like fighting pets are welcome <laughs> on the podcast <laughs> um and so anyways I had her my mom um was there and my mom's a very graceful um southern lady she makes the apple pies and the casserole <laughs> and stuff like that you know um and she she knew what was going on mm-hmm. she had seen bloody lips she had seen the bruises she knew what was going on but yet she wanted to hold that space for me to just say I'm here for you however you need me mm. I I don't you know my mom wanted to pull me from the situation but she didn't know how So she looked at, she cornered him at the hospital in the hallway before I had my daughter and said, I know what's going on between you guys. And mark my words, if you lay a hand on her or my daughter going forward, I will make sure that that is, that, that 
your life is hell. Like you're over if you touch me. You're over. Like this is grandma bear saying, I'm done. Well, he said the hell with you. Mm. I do what I want to do. Cuss her in the face, everything. And then walk back in the room. I'm like dilated at like an eight, right? I'm getting ready to like really do this thing. (laughs) And he whispers in my ear and says, I told you not to tell your family anything. And you did. You're going to wish you had never done that. You have her. You fight me in court over her. All hell is going to break loose. You know, a bunch of cuss words in between that, that I'm sure y'all can fill in the blanks. So I have my daughter. And what happens after you have a kid? Everything's kind of like honeymoon stage, right? All the um, hormones are flowing to for you to yeah, bond with the I mean, baby. The baby's here. It's like happy family. Everyone's excited. Um, I had her, and a couple hours later, he left to go to a bodybuilding show. Mm. He was there for the rest of the next two days, right? So he was super excited, clearly, about his child. Um, and I had my daughter. I um, still lived with my aunt. He kept saying, I want to do a house together. I want to have a home together. I kept saying, no, I don't think that's a good idea. Um, I had a couple instances where my car was vandalized, rope cut in the side of my car. Mm. Um, My tire slashed. I Um, wonder who that could have been. Oh, yeah. When I told my tires were slashed, the first thing he said was, oh, so you're saying it was me? (laughs) No, I never said it was you. Did you just say it was you? Because, um, and so, you know, that proceeded. And then, I don't know at what point it was, I think maybe because I was, I felt like I was a single mom because I was really, I was working full time, but I was paying for a nanny to come to the house and take care of my daughter. Um, And it was just everything that I had, right? It was just, I was exhausted. I was trying to do the whole breastfeeding thing, but working full time, but then raising my daughter and, and it felt like a lot. And then he was so awesome for like a four month period. Mm. Nothing. There was nothing, no arguments, no, no, nothing, no demeaning, no nothing. And I'll tell you four months with the life with a heavy, like someone like that, it felt like an eternity. Right. Long enough to like lull you back into a sense of security. Four months felt like to someone else, maybe like, I don't know, like five, 10 years. Yeah. Like four months, I was like, oh my gosh, like, holy moly, we actually made it to that point. Like we actually made it to that point. And that's all you'd like, ever wanted is to just have things be positive peaceful. and healthy and peaceful. Yeah. You know, I was like, oh my God, we're there. Right. Like we made it, right? What was I thinking? So we rent a house, a beautiful home, beautiful home, um, three bedroom, two bath, um, nice neighborhood in a good area. And, um, I'm starting to see all the drugs, like all the drugs, Mm -hmm. bags and bags of drugs. Like you would have thought he was a pharmaceutical, the amount of drugs that he had. And he would tell me, Hey, if anything ever happens to me, take this one bag to this person and they'll know what to do with it and they'll sell it and they'll give you the money for it. I'm like, I don't even know what's in that bag. Right. And he said, let's just say it's a little over a hundred grand and it'll be good for you guys. And I'm like, what? What a strange you know? insurance policy for you and your daughter too. That's very, right? you're yeah. like, Oh, how do you process uh, that? But when he, I started living with them, it was, um, I hate your hair, your hair. I want your hair to be black. I like black. Um, You're not tan. So I want you to take this injectable tan stuff and it'll make you tan because I don't really like white girls. Um, Your nail polish. I I don't like that French tip. I want them to be black. It needs to always be a dark color and I'll pay for your manicure and pedicure, but they need to be dark. Mm -hmm. Um, It was, well, you still have some more baby weight to lose. So you probably need to start going to the gym with me and I'll tell, and I'll like, I'll, I'll just uh, train you in between the other people I train. Um, 
I had this steroid that I use for women um, whenever they're getting ready for a show and it'll help you get to the point where I think you should be. Mm. And I'm like, I'm happy the way that I am. He's like, well, I'm not. Mm. So that controlling thought, like behavior started trickling back in. Right? And he's like, what do you want? You want me to go and be attracted to other women? Because if I'm not attracted to you, I'm going to get attracted to other people. He's like, and I train a lot of beautiful women. Right. So what do you think that I do with them whenever I'm not with you? You know, it was just very like, I was just so manipulated at that point. I was so beyond manipulated um, that at that point I was like maybe 120 pounds, which I'm 5'4", so I was a little probably below what would be look healthy, but I wasn't to buy my own clothes. He would buy them for me Mm. because he wanted me to wear certain brands. And so I would wear what he wanted me to wear. And if I went to work, he would come up there and he would watch me. Mm. And at one point he came in and he would, I would bring him food and I would find myself using my comp meal because I worked in a restaurant, my meal that I would eat for lunch, I would give to him for free because he was like, how is it that they won't give me a meal for free when I'm your boyfriend? Mm. Right. So I would just not argue and just give him the meal that would be mine. And I just went eat lunch and he would bring up conversations in the middle of the dining room and hawk loogies into my face. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I kind of skipped, he gave me a a ring and I said, "Um, I want you to wear this ring. And I said, I'll never marry you. And he said, you'll wear the ring. Right. So I wore the ring to kind of fast forward. It was like, we only lived together maybe six months or so, but it got so bad during that six months. He would leave pills laying on the floor. He was, um, he always had a lot of bloody noses. And so he would have these bloody noses and just leave napkins on the floor. It was just, it was, it was nothing. It, it was absolutely to myself, disgusting. I cleaned all the time. He ate seven, eight meals a day, but I was expected to make those and have them ready in the fridge. He wouldn't pick up my daughter because he was so fragile, right? Because he could break something and then he couldn't perform or, you know, look his best. Um, my weight got lower and lower. Um, my depression got worse and worse. Um, I got so small that I didn't want to see my family because I was afraid of what they would say because they would see how small I was getting. Right. Um, It was, I always wore long sleeve shirts to work or scarves during, even when it was warm um, to cover my neck or I would fix my hair a certain way to cover bruises on my face or a lot of makeup to cover them up. Always wore long pants Um, then my customers started noticing that I was losing weight and I would, you know, try and avoid conversations or avoid certain customers that were like kind of mom, dad figures. Mm -hmm. Um, and then (laughs) I kind of laugh. I I shouldn't laugh, but I laugh because we had a particular instance. This is where things kind of started coming to head and I started, actually getting out of the situation. I didn't know how to get out. Right. Um, it was my phone was tracked. My car was tracked. Um, my text messages, I had to leave my phone unlocked. Um, everything was tracked. Who I talked to to my sister. What'd you talk to your sister about? Right. What'd you tell her? You know? So we had one situation where we're sitting at the house one morning and my younger sister, um, I brought up my younger sister and he says, Oh, that whore. And he starts just talking really negatively about her. And so I was cooking what's the favorite bodybuilder food, boiled eggs. So I was cooking those on the stove and he comes up behind me and he's punching me over the head just repeatedly, just talking about, you know, what, who he thinks I am, like that I was a cheater and a liar. And I never took that lie detector test years ago. And, you know, everything gets brought up. Like I must've been a whore and a slut, all these things. And 
He punched over the head. I walk across the room, but I had a boil bag in my hand. And I turned around and I tossed it and it hit him straight in the forehead. Well, this egg had just gotten off the stove. Pretty hot. <clears throat> and it was a boiled egg yeah. straight off the stove. Um, my instant reaction was laughter because he was, I never fought back. Yeah. It's a big moment. But also because he was a bodybuilder in his underwear, balking around the house like a chicken. Oh my God. Oh my God. You know, just with this egg coming off of his forehead, singeing his forehead. And it, it was genuinely kind of funny to me um, until it wasn't funny. Right. Right. And so I grabbed my daughter because she was crying and I grabbed her and we had multiple locks on both of the doors. Go figure. And so I went to my bedroom and I recall just getting on the bed and just putting her around my, around my waist with her legs around my hips and just packing us with pillows because I knew that he was coming with this, his fist or something. And that's exactly what he did. He just stood over me and just punch, punch, punch over and over and over on my head. And then on my arms, my face. Um, my nose was bleeding and then he grabs a pair of cuticle cutters that were sitting on the bedside table and stabbed my leg. Mm. Well, you don't feel how bad that is in the moment. Right. It wasn't until I pulled up my pant leg and saw that like I had this is like, serious flesh, flesh hanging out. Right. And um <sighs> This is just how, um, how somebody like him is. He was in the bathroom and he was like, you messed up my face. My face is how I make money. How could you mess up my face like this? Do you know what kind of treatments I'm going to have to do to fix my face now? And it was just all about him. Him. Yeah. Like, I can't believe that you did this to this face. Like, this is, this is how I make money. How am I supposed to pay for my life? And da, 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 da. And I said, I had to go to the, I needed to go to the hospital and I needed stitches. And it wasn't until he came over and it was almost like a Jekyll Hyde that he clicked. Mm. And he was like, oh my God, you do need to go to the hospital. He was like, oh, that's bad. And I was like, yes, I need to go. He was like, well, you're not taking our daughter. And I said, um, I said, yes, I am. And he was like, if you do. I guarantee you that over the next couple of weeks, I'll plant drugs in your car and I have friends that are cops and I'll have them pull you over. Mm-hmm. You do that. I will make your life miserable and you will never be the kind of mom that you want to be. Guarantee you, you will leave her here. So he's grasping at straws at that point to just try and maintain power and control however he can, because he knows that it's threatened at that point. Like you fought back, which escalated into a huge fight. And A lot of extreme violence happens when abusive people feel like their power and control is being taken away from them or challenged. They do not like to be challenged. So you had just challenged him and, um, and then he wanted to use your daughter as a pawn because he probably knew at that point, well, you're, you know, he just stabbed you. So if you go to the hospital with your daughter, there's a chance that, you know, you could tell someone and and not come home and he wanted to keep you there. So he, if you, he had to keep your daughter with him because otherwise you were gone yeah and my nose is bleeding and I had bruises all over me and I had this gash on my leg and um the first place I went to wouldn't take me because I told them it was just a work accident Mm. so I went to a second place and they did take me and the lady was like are you sure this was a work accident and I was like, yes. And she was like, into your nose too? And I was like, yes, I just need, I just need to get taken care of so I can go home. I tried to like, keep it very blunt, right? Like I cannot have my daughter taken away from me. Right. And um, so I did what I had to do. I had 17 stitches, um, a few in my nose, and then let's see here, six in my nose. Anyways, I had about 17 total and went home and went back to work in a day or two, like nothing happened and just off we go. Right. Well, 
he got really bad after that, like even worse than before. Um, he started injecting more pain meds. It became, he couldn't get enough pain meds. It was injecting pain meds into his veins. Mm -hmm. It was becoming, I don't know what he was injecting. It was, um, you need to take this. It'll really relieve you after a long day. And I'm like, I don't want to do it. And he was like, you're going to do it. And I don't want to do it. And he grabs my arm and he injects. So it became where it was forcefully drugs, forcefully being injected. Um, my weight plummeted a lot. I didn't know what he was injecting. He would just say, Oh, it's just something to make you feel good. Coming from the background I came from, that would never, that would be in like a horror movie for me growing up, but never in my everyday life. And I think there's so much shame and stigma around substance use that um, even if it's forced, I think that gets inside your head and it's hard. And I've, and, and I've heard other survivors talk about their um, abusive partners, like forcing them to take drugs or coercing them to take drugs. And then it's like, well, who's going to believe you? You're just a drug addict, you know, and that narrative can get in your head. Like, how do I tell someone what's going on? How do I ask for help? They're going to, they're not going to believe me because they're going to just think I'm a drug addict, you know? And it, that's just, that's another manipulation tactic. It is. It absolutely is. Um, my, um, my weight was down to at that point, like 95 pounds. Mm. I was nothing fit. Um, I had to buy extra, extra small, which I never had before. Um, and so the, the last, there was a really bad night where ordinarily I typically wouldn't be able to tell the story without bawling my eyes out. Now it's gotten to a point where I can. Mm -hmm. There was one night that we were laying in bed watching a movie and my daughter was asleep and he had paused the movie and asked me if I had slept with somebody like four or five years ago or something, something like that. And I was like, we've already had this conversation before and it just ramped Mm -hmm. and it And I almost kind of blacked out a little bit there, but I was beat so severely and he had a police baton Mm. from a police officer friend of his that he just beat the crap out of me with. And then it wasn't enough for him. And so he had a pair of brass knuckles and just beat me until I just couldn't move. Mm -hmm. And then he said that wasn't enough. And he went and got a belt and it was just whipping me. And, um, I swore that that was probably like, you kind of think that this is probably it. Like there's no way that I would survive something like this. And I was, I had found myself, I grabbed the comforter and like wrapped myself completely in it and just balled in a corner and trying to soften the blows and he would rip it off. And he had um, a gun, actually two guns that he had gotten from a friend, a police officer actually. Mm. And um, had pulled it up to my head and had said, you know, that I was a worthless piece of shit and all these things and pulled the trigger and nothing happened. Mm. I know that I blacked out for a while I don't know how long, but I remember feeling like I didn't, like I couldn't move. Yeah. Like I was supposed to go to work the next day, yeah. like supposed yeah. to continue, get my daughter ready for it to go to her daycare. And I, I'm not a incredibly religious girl, but I started praying to anything and everything that was out there mm-hmm. to the creator above whoever you are, I just need to get out. I don't know how to get out. If you just save me from this and protect me, I will never look back. I will fight to the very end with everything that I have and I will trust in you and I will protect my daughter and put her first above everything. And I will, if you just get me out safely, that's, that was my, my prayer. Right. And 
I didn't sleep that night. Um, I think I was afraid that I would not wake up because my head was just, uh, it was just so bruised. Mm -hmm. I know that I, I'm sure I had a concussion. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, there's no way I would leave my daughter there. I knew I couldn't drive. I knew he probably wouldn't let me out of the house anyway. So the next morning I got dressed and I put on my makeup and I got my girl, my girl ready and I went to work and I wrapped myself up with sweaters and um, I must have been wearing three sweaters that day because I was so quote unquote cold. But I wasn't cold. I was still in a level of shock. Shock. I was going to say that your body was just in I so was, much shock. I yeah. was shaking so bad that people were asking me, "Are you? do you have a fever? Are you not feeling well? And I said, well, I, you know, things are just, you know, tough at home. He hasn't been feeling very well. And so it's just a lot of pressure. And um, I, people are looking at me weird. Mm-hmm. I'm sure I felt a little... I was very anxious. Um, one girl, I she pulled me outside, one of the other managers, and was like, you need to go home. And I was like, no. I And I found myself busting into tears because I didn't want to go home. Right. And I was like, I just, I need to be here. And anyways, it wasn't but a couple days later that um, my, um, he had to go in for a surgery. He had attacked me. He fell on the bed. He ripped a a tendon Mm -hmm. in his arm. He had to have surgery. So my aunt um, had called me because he had contacted her the night before and had cussed her out just because he's so Mm -hmm. uh, on so many drugs. and And this was the aunt that you had lived with before? Right. Okay. So she she knew probably and had seen some stuff before. So she... She was, he knew what was yep. going on. And I dropped him off to get his surgery. And I called her and I was like, I'm so sorry. He called you and did that. And um, I, I just, I, I'm so sorry. And I was crying. And she was like, she was like, baby, I have a one life, one lifeline phone call I can make to help get you out. But if I make this call, I can't make it again. It's a one-time call only. And I was like, what are you talking about? She was like, but you have to say you're ready. Mm. I'm like, I don't understand. And she was like, are you ready? That was it. Like she, there's no explaining, explaining. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You guys were on the level. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the next day I'm at work and I get a phone call at my work phone, the landline at work. And my aunt says, someone is coming to see you. Um, you can trust him. Um, that's all I can say. And I was like, uh. Secret agent, Anne. What? what are you talking about? <laughs> yeah. And she's like, I can't say anymore. I have to go. You can trust him. So I'm at work. It's very slow. And in walks this super, super burly, like six foot four giant. He's huge. He must be like 300 pounds. He's like, um, he's jolly green giant. And he's like, my name is Mark. Um, I'm here to work on marketing for the restaurant. And um, I'd like to show you some of our promotions. Um, Can we have a conversation? And I was like, what? Uh, Sure. (laughs) I'm like, I'm so confused Mm -hmm. at this point. So unbelievably confused. And so um, we start walking towards the table and he's like, um, your aunt sent me. So do you want to have a conversation here? Or is there somewhere we can walk and have a conversation? So I told my staff, you know, hold down the fort. I'm going to go have a conversation. We walked around a corner somewhere quiet. And he said, um, I'm with the safe haven group. Um, we extract women and children wow. out of home and put them into hiding and help you get back up on your own two feet and fight the court, fight him in court. Wow. Um, he was like, we're not a nonprofit. We do this all on our own. We're just a bunch of people have come together to fight for people who can't fight for themselves. Wow. 
I'm and like was, speechless. That's um, I've got like chills. Who? Wow, wow. I was like, wait, who does that? I'm sorry, who? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and he was like, um, now just so you know, our background is um, we have a lot of special forces, people who are in special forces that are part of our group. Um, we have people who are in IT. We have people who are mm-hmm. in the government. We have people who are overseas. We have, he's like, but most likely you'll never meet any of them. Right. Everyone's very quiet. It's an underground railroad. Right. He said, um, we've done extensive background check on you and your daughter and on him. And he is a very bad guy and we know everything about him. And he gave me his brother's name and his dad's name. He knew where he was from. He knew his dad's address. He knew everything. He told me where he worked out, where his gym was, who his clients were. I mean, he knew all these things. I was like, oh, okay. And so what I didn't realize is that he knew to make a couple of hand gestures to kind of see if whether or not I was telling the truth about my situation or not. And I didn't realize that I would flinched Mm. in certain movements that he made um, that gave him the, um, that he was able to confirm right he had certain ways of confirming I guess and he said listen um if this is what you want to do we've teamed up with the church they've already been let known that there's a girl and her daughter who need to get out and they've started um putting together supplies for you Mm. um they put together um shampoos clothes they know what size you are they know what shoe size they know um you have pillows blankets everything that you need the church is putting together everything. Um, oh, why I cry at that point. Um, that's beautiful. That's, that's so, and so he's like, but the thing is you have 24 hours. And I was like, what? I was like, no, 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 no. Like I, I don't have the finances for this. Like, can we, can I have like two weeks to think about it? And he said, no, you have 12 hours. So you call me at noon tomorrow. And, um, and let me know if you call me at 1201, I won't answer the phone. Mm. I'm like, are you kidding me? And he said, no, this is a very serious situation. And you have been accepted into a program because of the seriousness of your situation. Either you take it or you don't, and you'll never be able to get hold of us again. I was like, oh my gosh. So of course I get home and Mr. Lovely is lovely, right? He's super lovely at home. He's nice. He made me dinner, all these things. I'm like, this is odd. And of course I go back the next, I go to work the next day and I'm like, I can't leave. Like he was so nice last night. Right. Mm-hmm. I'm so, manipulated. so unbelievably manipulated. And so I call my mom and I'm like, mom, I got this call and I don't know what to do. She's like, I talked to your aunt. And I was like, oh, you did. And she's like, I think you need to go. And I just bawled, right? I'm like, mom, like, I don't know where I'm going. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know who these people are. It's scary to think about having to turn your entire life upside down in 12 hours. I was like, I've been at this job for four years. Like, I have a, I have a, a, I like, this is what I've been working for. Like, I don't, and she, and I was like, mom, I don't know what to do. And she's like, yes, you do. And I said, she goes, I'll never tell you what to do. Mm -hmm. You know what to do. And I remember particularly, I said, mom, I need you to tell me what to do for one time in my life. Tell me what to do. And she said, you need to fly, jump off the cliff, spread your wings and fly Mm -hmm. and trust that you will be caught. Mm -hmm. And I just bawled and bawled and bawled. Right. I called my boss and I'm like, I got to go. And she's like, what do you mean? I was like, so I gave her a quick breakdown and she came up there. My sister was already in her, on her way from out of town. My sister showed up like an hour later and, um, I gave my sister all my bank account information, passwords to everything. And I said, okay, well, I got to go do this. So we went home and I packed a bag. It was very hard that night. I tried to get pictures of things that was, I couldn't get pictures of, um, 
I packed one small bag and the next day we put a car, we, I put things in the car that night while he was sleeping. And the next morning I gave him a kiss on the forehead and he was like, don't touch me. Mm. I told my daughter to give him a hug and um, she said, no. And at this point she was only 16 months old. She was a baby and uh, we ran and we were gone for 107 days with this group Uh, with this group we went to multiple locations um we were with the sweetest kindest most loving people Mm. that just just opened their hearts and their homes and their arms and like they never judged that here here up walks this girl that's like barely 90 pounds with this 16 month old baby on her hip and a bag and they have no idea who I am, but yet they open their arms and hug me and just like my diet was burgers, fries, ice cream, um, fried chicken, all the comfort like, food, all the comfort foods, right? Like there was, they were telling me, okay, you can't, you're not allowed to have vegetables. You're not allowed to have <laughs> like all the good stuff. Um, and that was um, May 6th of 2016 that I left. Um, so here I am now, it's been four years. Um, the court system was brutal. It's, it's really, really difficult. Um, the emotions going through all of that is probably a whole story on its own. Oh, I know. I mean, I know so many survivors who, come out on the other side of this like horrifically traumatic experience and then are totally traumatized again by having to relive it all and and just fight tooth and nail for some semblance of justice you know in the courts and and it's and it's not a guarantee which is scary um and people's reputations are ruined their names are just raked over the coals they have to give all of the resources that they have emotionally physically financially And then, you know, there's no guaranteed outcome. And that's just, I mean, it's a real injustice, um, but it's also just, it's, it's, it's so unfair. It's so unfair for survivors to have to go through that. And, and so where are you at in that court process now? Was there like a conclusion to that or is it still ongoing? Well, um, my DA that was assigned, my assistant DA that was assigned to my case um, was absolutely the most supportive, amazing woman I've ever met in my life. She never made me feel like a number. She would email me just to say, I'm thinking about you today. And I want you to know, I think you're amazing. Keep your head up. Just not because there was anything to tell me, except for that. She was thinking about me. Like, I just, um, I know that not all DAs are like that. She had this heart, like when I went in and shared my story with her, she heard me. Like it wasn't just writing things down on a piece of paper, you know, and her head down the whole time. Like she looked at me and heard me in my case. um, He fought it really hard. He was looking at a lot of time. Um, The system is extremely um, unjust. Um, he already had a history of violence come to find out with multiple women. He had, uh, locked a girl in the trunk of his car and drove around in the middle of, um, the heat with her locked in his trunk for hours, and put a knife to her throat, um, had beat her up. I mean, all these things I didn't know. Um, he had a history. Um, but when it came down to it, Um, I fought for three years in criminal court. And um, when it came down to being in that victim's room, just waiting to go up on the stand, um, they, they told me that um, they brought in another DA there the last week Mm. to team up with the one that I had. And he came in and said, I think that we're going to give him a plea. And I was like, what do you, 
what do you mean a plea? And he was like, we're going to give him a plea of probation. Mm-hmm. And I said, and I bawled, right? My mom had an anxiety attack. That's scary. Um, that puts you at real risk. I mean, probation is, I mean, it, it doesn't guarantee safety. That person is out in the world still. They can do whatever they want. Probation isn't going to keep them from harming you. Right. That's so scary to um, know. But I look at my other DA, right? Her name is Catherine. And she's just tears. And I was like, I want everyone out of the room. I just want to talk to Catherine. And he was like, well, we need to go. We need to get back in there. And I was like, I need to talk to Catherine. And I looked at her and I was bawling. And I'm like, why? I don't understand. And she's like, I did everything I can do. Like, I think that we just have to, because the system is so manipulated and it's, it's manipulated in a way of which we can't understand. Um, there was a plea there that they wanted to just make sure and have, they didn't want to take the chance of the jury going South and them not getting that plea. And so he did get a felony. Um, it was a felony three. Um, he had to plead guilty. Um, he got five years of probation um, all these classes to take. And, um, I got to get up and give my, you know, victim's impact statement. And after, you know, when I got through, he didn't look at me the whole time, but when I got through, he just shot me a thumbs up. (laughs) And, um, but that was, you know, I, that didn't, I expected something of sort. Um, yeah. Um, he he is at a point right now, we are at a point where I'm still fighting in civil court for my daughter. He the court has the civil court has told him that if he can't get off steroids, he can't have his daughter. And he's an addict. He's been on it 17, 18 years. He has attempted to fight court to tell him he needs them to survive. Um, and it hasn't been able, it hasn't gone anywhere yet. Which may or may not be true, but that's beside the point, you know. That doesn't, you know, mean that he should therefore have access to your daughter. Right. Um, I never talk at ill will about him to her, mm. but he does create who he is to her. Sure. And I have to get very creative on, on helping her build her mind as knowing that she's a girl that's going to become a woman right. one day. And you know, helping her work through why would he say this and what does that mean? And what do you think about that? And how does that make you feel? And um, is that something that makes you happy? Is that something that makes you sad? Is that, you know, and she's brilliant. She's five years old. She's, she's the light of my life. She's incredible. I, And go figure, I work for a corporate security company now. Um, I work with people who used to work for the FBI and CIA. And it's just, it's kind of ironic that I would have such a blessing in a job Mm -hmm. that I'm in. Um, That was, I feel like is only by the grace of God, really. It kind of came full circle in a weird way too, you know, that that's like almost this, like, you are keeping people safe. That must feel kind of, I don't know, cathartic on some level, maybe? We work, well, kind of backtrack, we work in electronics. Mm -hmm. So, like, I I keep electronics safe, really. But um, but it is, like, I'm in a world of, like, there is people that I can go to to get advice on things. And there's cameras everywhere. Right. Like, I'm clocking in and all over this, this gigantic building of, like, there's no way that anyone can really get into that place without having, you know, the right badging to get in. Um, I have an incredible roommate. She's like, she's so supportive. She treats my daughter like she's her own. Um, and which is where she's at today. Um, my detective was amazing. My victim's advocate was incredible my DA. So I had some relationships that I've built that I know were probably not everyone's experience. Um, and it makes me sad to think that people wouldn't get that experience. Um, at the end of the day, I had to create my own justice within a very unjust system. 
And I had to think, well, I can't make anything happen the way it was supposed to, but maybe, I mean, I can't make anything happen the way that I thought that's what I want to happen, but maybe that was what he had to have happen for him. He's remarried. He married shortly after all of it happened. Um, it looked better on him in court mm. to have a to have a wife. Interesting. Um, he has a child, um, another child. Um, his family um, is from Iran. Um, so there's always a, a high security for me in regards to the level of um, involvement that I, that come to find out that his family has with smuggling certain types of things mm-hmm. in and out of the country. Gotcha. Um, me putting this light of court onto his family was very frowned upon overseas. Risky for you. And because of that, there was a level of security that was put over us that I don't think would have been there otherwise. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't know, there's just a level of life I have to live now that would be very probably not so normal for others. Mm-hmm. Um, but it is, I guess it is my normal. I, so what does that normal look like for you now? A very, very heightened level of awareness. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I always have to think, think 10 steps ahead. Right. Um, I still don't date. (laughs) I'm still healing and I'm okay with that. I'm, I'm dating myself. I guess. Oh, I love that. (laughs) Falling in love with yourself. Yeah. Because I lost myself in all of that. The level of, uh, that I was at was just not me. I mean, anyone that knows me would be like, wow, like you were what? Mm. Yeah. I mean, he took that away from you. It was horrible. Yeah. And sometimes I still have to see him when we go into court. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, I've had to find a piece of mine that it's taken four years to create. Mm-hmm. Um, going to a retreat that I went to last year and meeting Stevie was was incredible it was like this turning point for me um because I just had trial I just my criminal trial had just ended and it was like meeting all these incredible women who were like well this is my story and this is my story and you know my story sounds extreme but I don't know that it's any harder than anyone else's Mm. because they're all hard But I also, I was telling my dad last night that at what point do we think that we can't create our story again? Mm -hmm. No, like we are incredible human beings. We're made incredibly Mm -hmm. and we can create that story for ourselves at any point. Um, We just have to believe in ourselves that we can recreate that. Right. That that experience that you went through doesn't define you. You have your whole life ahead of you. Um, and your daughter has her whole life ahead of her. And you guys, you know, probably more or less are safe enough right now where you can create space for you to reconnect with yourselves and each other and become excited about being alive again. I I keep thinking in my head about the phrase that your mom said about like jumping off the cliff and flying. Like you have the chance to spread your wings right now, you know, which is probably painful and scary in a lot of ways, but also like very, very exciting. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, I have a lot of gratitude to just things in life, you know, like it brought a level of gratitude for like, just everything, like just the tiniest things, just showing gratitude, you know, that people stuck themselves out to help us in a time when I didn't think that anyone would be there Mm -hmm. because I wasn't allowed to talk to my family or my friends for the 107 days. We just dropped off. Right. We became non-existent. Had to go into hiding. 
Yeah. And I think it's, it's like, you know, obviously when you, you hear a story like yours, it's so scary and it shows you a lot of like the dark sides of humanity, some of the darkest shit <laughs> in humanity, I, but it also shows some of like the lightest parts of humanity too. And like what is so am- amazing about people, cause we can suck, like people suck, but we, we also can be really amazing. And it, that I think I'm hearing that message in your story and that's a really hopeful and like beautiful reminder too. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Wow. I just thank you so much for sharing. I'm like pretty blown away right now. And I just feel really honored that you, that you feel safe. I know it's long. No, <laughs> no. It deserves being told the way that you want it to be told and, and, and the right way. Um, I guess I just, I usually like to end every episode by asking if you could like speak directly to our listeners, to any survivor who might be listening right now, like what would you want to tell them? Um, there's so many things. Um, but to kind of sum it up, um, that everyone knows what their worth is underneath it all. Although they're told every day, probably, you know, if they're in a bad situation, they're told who they are. Mm but you know what your strength is and you know what your worth is. You know what that is and what you can do. Of course, mine was a bit of an extreme of getting out, but I also found that there's unbelievable amount of resources out there Mm -hmm. to help women and children get out. Um, That mine was just one of many Mm -hmm. that are out there. And um, that you take the good days or the bad days. You cry when you need to cry. Mm-hmm. And then you get up and you straighten your crown. Mm, I love that. <laughs> and you put your nose up and you wipe your tears and you keep going. And the next day you may fall and cry again. And it's okay yeah. to just cry and get it out and have swollen eyes the next day. And you know what? Get up, straighten your crown and keep going again. I had to do that and still have to do that so many times. Four years later, I still have to do that all the time. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, my crown always falls. Mm. And I'm always putting it <laughs> back in place. <laughs> so I love that analogy, though, because you definitely have a crown. You're like a little Southern queen <laughs> with your beautiful bangs and your hoop earrings. And I just like I wish you had a crown, like an actual physical crown on right now. <laughs> <laughs> because, I feel like it's an, it's an invisible one that yeah, I see the so. metaphorical crown but you do like you really do radiate like I'm um I just have done some of these interviews in person and some recorded like this and like even through a screen I just like your energy is so it's really beautiful and I can like feel it all the way over here in Montana um yeah and again I just like I yeah I can't thank you enough for being so vulnerable and for sharing so much with us I think um this, I mean, your story is incredibly powerful. And I think that story sharing is so important for other survivors so that they know that they're not alone. And you, by you being so generous, so generous with your story, you're helping other people feel not alone. And that's, um, I mean, that's what we're all about. And so, yeah. I hope so. I know, I know there's someone out there that yes. is, has to be living something like, yes, you know, um, that was a search for me was I have to find people who can understand. Yes. Like, I need to feel that somebody understands. And I found that and we are her. Yeah. And I found that in some other support groups and it's been incredibly empowering. Yeah. And indescribably empowering. Yeah. You're not alone. We're out here. There are, there are people <laughs> who understand and there are resources and, and people to help. Um, so thank you again so much and I think we're gonna call it a call it a wrap. All right. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, thank you. We hope you enjoyed the podcast. Be sure to subscribe and don't forget to check out our online community at weareher.net. If you or someone you know has experienced abuse or assault, you can always call the National Domestic Violence Hotline at 1 800 799 7233